Good morning, church. Good morning. All right. It's nice to see everyone this morning. You know, every first Sunday of the month, we actually um, have our communion. So you have your elements with you. But before we go to our, our verse for this communion, I want to let you know the reason why we're doing this, right? This isn't just a tradition that we have to fulfill, right? Some kind of to-do list that we can check off to say, well, we've done this. But the purpose why we do our communion, why we have communion together, is that we can remember what Jesus has done for us. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26, if we had that. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant, the new agreement, the new promise between God and his people. And so we remember this day because it is the new beginning that we are reconciled with God, that we can actually have access to the Father, and that is through Jesus. It says, an agreement confirmed with my, bod, my, my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes Again, And so as we do our communion, let's not think of it as something that we just have to do. But let's remember what Jesus has done for us individually and corporately as a church. We are now the body of Christ. We are now in community with one another. And more than that, we are now reconciled and we have this relationship with God, that we can call unto him and we can say, Abba, our heavenly father. How amazing is that, right? And so as we um, take this communion, let that be our prayer. Let, let we say thanksgiving to God for, for what he has done in our lives. So why don't we just stand as we take the elements together. Let's eat from the bread together. Thank you, Father. And let's drink from the cup together. Let's all pray. Father, we thank you that you love us so much and so dearly that you gave your son, your beloved son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us. Lord, we don't deserve it. God, we don't deserve your love and your grace, and yet you give us to us freely. It is for free, God, but it's not cheap. It's priceless, and yet you give us that. So we thank you and we remember this, not just today, but in every day of our lives, that we remember what you have done in our lives, that we are now saved through faith God, that we have been redeemed through Christ. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for this access that we have. Lord, that we don't have to go through person after person. We can just come straight to you, Lord, and you will hear our cries and our prayers, and you will be our God, and we will be your people. So we thank you, Lord, for today, and bless us, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. You may now be seated. Thank you. You know, we're, we're still in our series, The God of Our Fathers. And, and before uh, that, I want to introduce myself. If you don't know me, my name is Marie. And I'm always privileged to stand in front of you to share God's message. And I particularly love this series because it actually gives us an opportunity 
to discover who God is through the lens, through the perspective, through the lives of those who have gone before us, the men and women of faith in the Bible. And so even though it's in the distant past, right, that it happened a long time ago, it remains relevant today. It holds as much significance today. Why is that? Well, if you think about it, if you want to get to know someone, right? If you want to get to know them, you don't really know them that well. For example, if you're quite new to your office, right, your work, and you want to get to know your boss a little bit, but you're kind of shy, right? You don't want to approach them and be like, so who are you, right? You don't really do that. What do you do? You go to your coworkers and you ask them, right? You ask them. And you typically ask this question. You say, well, what are they like? What is he like? The same if you are a young adult, right? If you want to take a class, you usually look up the professor because that matters, right? And so you look up this professor and you even talk to your friends. You, you talk to the, the people, the students that would take this class or, or actually took the class already. And you would ask them, what is he like? What's his grading system like? Is he actually would be able to pass me? Because by doing so, you get a glimpse of how they are, and it's an indication of how they would be towards you, right? It's not a guarantee, but at least you kind of know, okay, well, he has that sense of humor, or maybe, you know, he's, he's quite nice, he's trustworthy. You could know that by asking other people who know them personally, what are they like? And it's the same with God. And actually, it's so much better because for us, it's just an indication, right? Well, if they're a man or woman of their word, then you know that it's most likely that they will be trustworthy to you as well, right? But it's just an indication. It's not a guarantee. But with God, it is a guarantee. How he was in the past will stay the same today and forever. And so it is a guarantee that when we, look at God, when we look at God and we look at his character in the Bible, we know that it is the same God that we worship and serve today. There is assurance of who God is today. And so it is much relevant to us to actually take a look at how God presented himself to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to David, to these men and women of faith. Because we know that if their God is that kind of God, we serve as well a big God. We don't serve a mediocre God. And so we look at our faith, we get to take a look at our faith and we get to be excited. Who's excited to really discover who God is this morning? There should be so much excitement in our hearts because we get to see who God is. So we know that we don't serve a mediocre God. We serve and worship the God most high. And that is El Elyon. And we can see that in Genesis 14. Let's go there says, after Abram returned from defeating Kedorlaomer and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shaveh, and that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. And he blessed Abram, saying, blessed be Abram by God most high. And this is the first mention of God being God most high, says creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. He gave him his tithes. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, With raised hand I have sworn 
an oath to the Lord God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the strap of a sandal, nothing, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but my men have eaten, but what, what my men have eaten, and the share that belongs to the men who went with me, to Aner, to Eshkol, and to Mamre. Let them have their share. And so we can actually go back to the very beginning. Um, at this time, there was a lot of conquest and rebellion. And so there was actually a confederation of kings, of four kings who rebelled against the five kings. And they went, then went to battle, but instead of the five kings overpowering the four kings, it was actually the four kings who won the battle. And because they won, then they actually took everything with them, including Lot. And Lot was actually Abram's nephew. And so, once Abraham knew of this news, he then called out 318 of his talented men, his talented and trained servants to um, rescue Lot. And we know this, we know what happened to um, Abraham because we begin by saying that Abraham returned after defeating the four kings. So Abraham was successful. He was victorious. And so after that, then Melchizedek came and brought out bread and wine. And he said, blessed be Abraham by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And Abraham declared that he serves the God most high. And what's interesting about it is that Abraham is saying that he is serving the one and the true living God, no one else. Because during that time, polytheism was such a prevalent norm. So that was the norm back then. Everyone worshipped many gods. But, you know, everyone worshipped many gods and each god would have to be appeased, right? But during that time, Abram took a stand and said, I only worship one God, and this God reigns over everything and anything, whether it's in the physical or supernatural, he reigns over anything. And so that is the attitude and declaration of Abraham. He's saying that I serve the all-surpassing God, the supreme God, superior in every way. And so you think for a moment, well, that's cool, right? It's cool that we get to see how Abram declared that he was the God most high. Well, we don't live in a polytheistic environment anymore, not prevalent, not, not a lot of people do that, but I believe that we've just dressed them more discreetly. We've put them on pretty dresses, and we say, well, we don't worship anything else. But in reality, we do. We do. Because we may not worship the false god of nature, but we put money over everything and anything. You know, we might not worship openly anyway, the God of prosperity, but fame and power we have put on a higher pedestal than God. See, the object of reverence changed, but human nature and attitude stays the same. And so this is why we need it. 
today because God is saying whatever is happening in your life, whatever you are facing in your life, whatever worries and problems that you have, he is higher than those things. And so you can be rest assured that you serve the God most high. So you don't have to be afraid anymore. You don't have to cower in fear. You stand courageously knowing that you serve this God. That is the God most high. But we've actually turned our focus away from that and into material things, whether we like it or not. You know, God Most High is saying, well, God has the power and authority over everything. But now we seek power and authority in itself. Have you ever tasted what it it feels like to have power, to have some kind of influence? It's very deceiving. You know, I remember this time, um, this time that I actually, uh, this was the first time that I had a Christmas party with my work, and um, it was a, a club, I'm not going to disclose, it's not a club club, but it's actually a restaurant, okay, I, I want to I be certain of that, it's some kind of social club, Okay, there we go. It's some kind of social club. I have never been to clubs. I will say that. But it's some kind of social club, right, at work. And you then have to dress to the T. You know, if you're a guy, you have to make sure that you are in suits, right? If you're a woman, then some kind of blazer, maybe a dress or maybe a suit, right? You have to appear like you have some influence. And so that was my first time being in that social club. I didn't even know it existed. And so when I came in, there was this person greeting us. And so they were like, well, are you the party of your company? And I said, yes. And so you know that it's something else when they have a separate coat room, right? And so I didn't really have any expectation of what it was. And so she greeted me and she said, well, I will escort you now to the court, the, the coat room. And I said, okay, thank you. And so I put off my, my, my um, coat and I was like, I don't know what I'm doing here. This is not my place, but okay, I'm going to pretend like this, I belong here, right? And so after putting my coat, um, the lady was waiting for me. And she said, well, I will now escort you to the, um, not the dining, but it's a, kind of a lobby that they have. But it's not the lobby that we see in restaurants. There's a bunch of different places, and you sit in these fancy chairs, and then you can order whatever you like while you're waiting for your table. I mean, that is something else. Right? And so I was escorted there and I sat there. I'm like, I still don't think I belong here, but fake it till you make it, right? So I was sitting there and I was like, okay, let me just um, order this, something that I don't really know. And then later on, a butler came in and they're like, oh, let me now escort you to the dining room. And so we went to a separate dining room and we sat, and actually, we sat there and On our way, we saw judges and lawyers and politicians and people that you don't normally see in Polo Park, right? And so I was like, oh, I must be in a different universe, right? And I sat there in the dining room. They give us the menu. And what is the first thing that you do when you are given a menu? You look at the price, right? If you're paying for yourself, you look at, okay, what is the cheapest here? Okay, I have $50 in my bank account. This must be, uh, this fits the budget. But if it's not really for you, like you're not paying for it, then you look at what is the most expensive here, something I don't normally eat, right? You look at the price. But I know it's, it's a different, it's a different um, social 
and political status because I take a look at it and there are no prices. And so I take a look at the menu and I'm like, I don't even know which one. I don't know what's most expensive or what's not because the price isn't even there. And so, you know, they've, they've um, treated us so well. And throughout these, the, the evening, I realized that this must be how people with power and influence feel to be taken care of. You know, you don't even have to worry about the price. That's fine, right? You don't even have to worry about money or anything else. It must be a good feeling to have. And so, in human nature, I understand our need for those things, to have power and authority. But I have great news for you. Because what God has to offer is so much more than what I could ever experience, what you could ever experience in your life. Because he's not just in the same status as those lawyers and judges and politicians and business people. He actually rules over them. And so can you believe that the God that you serve and worship is higher than any of those things? And so we thank God that we love and serve that God, the God most high. And so if we do, then you will place, if you think and believe that God reigns as the most high in your life. You will place your trust in him and him alone. You don't have to seek material things. You don't have to seek for that kind of power and influence. At the end of the day, that was just one night. But I wake up next morning knowing that, Lord, regardless of whether I have plenty or I have none, I have you. And that's what matters the most. Amen. So we place our trust in him. We depend on him. And so let's go back to Abram. Abram, having heard the circumstances his nephew was in, he called out his servants immediately. Now, let's put ourselves in Abram's shoes for a moment. Think about it. Your family member has been kidnapped, has been taken captive. Now, not just by anyone, but by the four kings. And they, were, they have already declared themselves as the victors. They've already won the battle. And you only have limited resources. You only have limited men. You're not really the greatest of the greatest. You're just an ordinary man. What would you do? Let's be honest for a moment. What would we do? Well, you know, if we know that the odds are against us, most of us do a cost-benefit analysis, right? We take a look at the cost, okay, the disadvantages, the benefits, and then see, okay, you know what? There's a lot of cost, not a lot of benefit, right? And then maybe we take a look at different options. Well, you know, we don't have to rescue Lot right away. Maybe let's see how it goes, right? Maybe there's something that would happen, right? Or maybe after doing all of that, we say, well, we did what we could. The best that we could, Lot had a good life, he would be fine. Maybe it's meant to be. You know, honestly, how many of us would turn away from the battle even before it begins? Let's raise our hands. Who could do that? Who would actually do that? Be honest. Would you actually say, yes, I'm going to fight this losing battle? Or would you say, wait, hold up a minute. Let me think about it. And while you're thinking of raising your hand, your family's looking at you. But 
truthfully, we have all of these thoughts and we even doubt whether we could do it. But Abraham, knowing full well that he had so much of a smaller force than the four kings, he was still in full confidence. Not because of his skills, not because of his status, not because of what he had, but he knew that he had the God Most High with him. And nothing can beat that. He knew that in his heart. You know, he's saying, well, I may be against four kings, but my God, he is the king of kings. He is the king of kings. And so I will not be afraid. I will not cower in fear because I know who is with me. So I can put my trust in God. Even when he's fighting a losing battle, he can still declare that. Can we do the same? Can we do the same? I hope so. But let's take a look at our lives right now. Do we do the same? Do we actually put our faith in God more than anything else? See, even if the four kings had already won, Abraham knew that he was serving the God Most High. And because of that, he knew that the God Most High rules and can overrule anything. You know, similarly, similarly we take a look at the court system that we have. I know it might be boring, but hold on a minute. I got, I got a, a point here to make. I don't want people like sleeping or like court system. I don't even want to think about it. But let me just, let me just um, tell this for you. Now, here in Canada, right, we have different courts. You got that? Okay. Everything's good so far. Now, if you have a substantive legal claim, right, if you um, want to sue someone, for example, or if you have family or family law, criminal law, whatever that is, um, you then generally would go to Manitoba King's Bench. So that's our superior court here in Manitoba. And so if you say, you know, judge, um, I have this claim against someone, please reside over it. That's not how it actually works. But just saying, you know, I, I, please reside over it. Please decide for me. The judge then decides. And if you don't like the decision of the judge, then, or if it's not in your favor, then you can appeal to the Court of Appeal, the Manitoba Court of Appeal. So that's good. But that does not have the final say. In certain circumstances, you can still appeal to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court of Canada actually hears decisions and appeals in all provinces and territories, regardless of where you are in Canada. And so when the Supreme Court then holds their decision, they say, this is what we have decided on in your claim. It not only changes or overturns the decisions of the lower courts, although they have authority to make such decisions, they can say, you know what? No, we're not going with that. We have our own decision. We have the final say. But not only that, it actually changes the way we perceive and apply the law. So when a similar claim is brought again in the future, then we take a look at the decision of the Supreme Court and we have to go and abide by what they say. But see, the Supreme Court of Canada only has 
power and authority in the judicial system here in our country, but our God has power and authority over all nations and all locations and whatever circumstances you are in. He can overturn any decision of the enemy, any work of the enemy, anything that you are going through, he can turn it for your good according to the purpose he has for you. That is the God that we serve. He has the final say in your life. And so you can trust in him. But then how do we respond to the God that we trust and serve if we know that he is the God most high? Well, the first thing is, if we really believe this, then prayer comes naturally. Prayer comes naturally to us. It says in Philippians 4, 6 to 7, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. The reason for this, you can watch in a Higher Life, this is a little plug, but, but one of my favorite verses, it says, don't worry about anything. Don't be anxious about anything. Yes, whatever you are thinking of right now, however big that is, the reason why you couldn't fall asleep at night, the reason why you worry, don't worry about that. Your career, your future, what you will eat and drink, everything. Don't worry about that. Instead, what does God want us to do? To pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace. You know, when God gives you peace, you know that it's not as the world gives. It's the kind of peace that only God can give, which exceeds, which transcends, which is far more superior than anything we can even think of. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So we pray because it is our expression of our trust in him. It's our expression of our trust. You know, when you genuinely come to God whenever you are in need, you don't really come with pride, right? You humble yourself because you know that you can't do it alone. That if you go by what you just say, you know that you will fail. And so you come to God and you say, Lord, I know that even when they have decided this in my life, God, that you can overturn this decision for your good. You can come to God by doing that. But it requires a shift of perspective. It requires a shift of our focus. Let's actually take a look at this picture now, nice car, um, it's not mine, just found it on the internet, but let's look at this picture, right? Now, if I ask you, and I'll be specific here, which one or what is, what looks the biggest here? What looks the biggest? Well, based on the picture, basically, what's front and center? The car, right? That looks bigger. But you know I would be lying if I say a car is actually bigger than a mountain. Right? In this picture, it might look big. But in reality, you know the mountains are so much bigger than cars. Even a dozen of cars would not equate to the size of the mountains. But why do we do the same with our problems? 
Well, because oftentimes we let problems be the center and focus of our lives, that we don't really see how big our God is. How high our God is, how faithful he is. We just need a shift of perspective. We need a shift of focus, and we do that by praying. We then develop the understanding that God is sovereign. So regardless of how your problems are, whether they're right in front of you, you know for a fact that your God is the God most high. And so you face your problems not by worrying, but praying to God, giving God the thanksgiving. That is a life of someone who truly believes that God is the most high God. You know, not only that, but we enjoy his peace that transcends all things. We get to experience that. Not just the good things, but the bad things. It says in Romans 8, 28, we know that God causes everything, even the good and bad, to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. He will work things out for you according to the purpose that, you ha- that Jesus has for you. And so we have this peace when we trust and we give God every need that we have. But not only that, great things are to be expected when we pray to the, mo- to the most high God. Let's go to James 5, 16 to 18. It says, the prayer of a righteous person. And James doesn't talk about righteousness in terms of your achievements. He talks about righteousness through faith. And we can see that in Romans 3. It says, well, everyone has fallen short of God's glory, but we are all justified through faith and by the grace of God. And so we know that we are righteous if we have the right standing with God, if we are reconciled with God. And we know that if we are righteous, then we are, that our prayers are powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are, but he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. You know, I love that James talked about Elijah being one of us, right? Because we know that it's not based on our achievements. The miraculous things that happened in Elijah's life wasn't the result of Elijah being Elijah. The miraculous things that happened in Abraham's life wasn't a result of him being Abraham. But it is through his faith in God that he was able to do that. It is through his prayer, his commitment, and total dependence on God. And we see that in 1 Kings 18 when Elijah was actually bowing down and he fell and he, his feet were between his knees as a, as a sign of total dependence on God. He knew that it would not rain if God did not want it to rain. He knew that God is sovereign, and so he was in total dependence on God. Let's do the same, that we pray daily, not, you know, just in passing. Lord, bless me. Thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Right? But in total dependence To God, saying, Lord, we can't do this without you. Lord, if it's just us, we're going to fail. But we 
should pray because we know that the righteous person's prayer is powerful and effective. And not only that, we meditate his words. You know, Joshua 1, 8 says, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it, that you will be prosperous and successful. Meditate on it, not just reading it as a checklist so that you could say to your leader, you could say to Pastor Junie, oh yeah, I've read, I've read the Bible, right? Or you've, you can say to your friends or your family that you have done that. No, we meditate on his word because we want to know him. We want to know his plans for us. We want to know what kind of God is he. We meditate on it. We mutter the things of God. You know, have you ever heard of the saying that our brain is like a sponge, right? Especially when we were kids. Because it absorbs everything. And so this is important that we meditate, that we actually ponder, we think, and we focus on God's word, and we surround ourselves with God's word because if the brain can absorb what goes on around us, what we surround ourselves with matters greatly, right? And so if you're always on your phone, and especially when you're on TikTok or Instagram, you might have heard of a lot of audio, right? And a lot of trends, and then you find yourself doing the same trends unconsciously. Why? Because that's all you can think about, and yet that's all you consume. And the same thing is with meditation of God's word. When we believe that God is sovereign, that he's superior in every aspect, we take his word seriously. And we meditate on it every day of our lives because it affects us. It does, right? Let's look at... Uh, an article on Mayo Clinic, it says there, indeed, some studies show that personality traits such as optimism and pessimism can affect many areas of your health and well-being. The positive, positive thinking that usually comes with optimism is a key part of effective stress management. And effective stress management is associated with many health benefits. The thoughts that run through your head, if your thoughts align with what God says, if your, thought, if your thoughts align with the scriptures, then it will actually help you. But if your thoughts that run through your head are mostly negative, your outlook on life is more likely pessimistic. And if your thoughts are mostly positive, you're likely an optimist, someone who practices positive thinking. But we know that the Bible doesn't just offer us positive thinking, not just wishful thinking, but it is the truth that gives us assurance. It is actually the truth that helps us when we are feeling alone, when we're feeling forgotten, when we're feeling like we're on the brink and on the edge and we can't do anything already. The Bible gives us the truth. And we see that, and we see that in the scriptures. You know, that's why Paul always reminds us to renew our minds to fix our eyes on Jesus, because what we think about matters greatly. If we think that God is the God most high, then we're likely to be confident when we're walking out of this building, knowing that he is with you. But when you then think of your problems alone, and you think they're just 
so big that God can't handle it, then your outlook in life would be different. And so this is why it's very important for us to meditate on his words. And we see that in the life of Abraham. You know, you see in the, in the previous chapters and even after this, Abraham was communicating with God, was meditating on God's word. He just didn't do things thinking that everything would work out. No, he was full of confidence because he knows who his God is. And that is through prayer, meditation, and finally, through obedience. You know, it's quite contrary for us to say, yes, we trust God, but at the same time, we don't really obey him, right? Because obedience is the result of our submission to God's authority. It is the result of our submission to God's authority. You know, for those of you who have kids, we'll kind of understand this, right? Uh, for those of you who don't have kids, you, un you remember growing up, especially when they're in their preteens, teenager, right? They have um, this phase where they just um, say no to everything you say, right? Because they started to think that, you know, we know better, right? For those of you who have kids, you've gone through that, right? Where we have this notion that we know better because we can think for ourselves now. And so it's difficult and I remember as well growing up, it was difficult for me to obey my parents and to submit to my parents' authority because I thought I knew things. But that's not true, right? The same thing with God as well. If we know that God is in control of everything, even when we are uncertain. Even when we are faced with something we have never faced before, we know that because God has authority and power over anything and everything, we can obey him and we can follow what he says. And the same with Abraham. He immediately called his servants. He didn't even think and ponder, but he immediately took action. You know, the Latin word for obedience really is to hear. So this morning, do you hear God's instructions? And if you say that you worship and serve the God most high, do you then follow his instructions? Obedience comes from faith, from trust, that God knows what he's doing more than us. We know this because what does it say in the Bible? His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. His ways are higher than your ways. Then why do you have to even think about it? Why do you even have to ponder that God has your best interests in mind? So it is actually easier for us to obey God because we know that he will not lead us astray. You know, people... Even our family, our loved ones can disappoint us. When, we, when they give advice, sometimes they might be wrong. But when we come to God, we know that God can actually see everything, our past, present, and future. And so why do we actually go to other things, other people, more than we come to God? Trust in him and obey him, for he knows the best for you. And so, lastly, if my complete trust is in God most high, he will be 
my ultimate source. He will be the only source, source of provision, source of strength, source of peace, source of contentment. He will be your only source. Let's go back to um, Genesis 14. I believe it starts with 19, yes. It says, blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. He gave him his tithes, what belongs to him. Because he knows that giving that much would not really affect him because his God owns everything. His God is sovereign over anything. He does not have to try to count his money, try to count the possession that he has. Oh, maybe I'm giving too much, right? Maybe, you know, um, God would understand, right? There's no such thinking in his mind. He just gave him a tenth of everything. But not just that, the king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom with raised hand, with raised hand, I have sworn a commitment with God. I've sworn a promise, an oath to the Lord God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread, not even a strap, not even a penny, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. Not only did he give what belonged to the Lord, he also said, you know what, I'm not going to accept the distribution that you're proposing here because I don't want this to be confused and say, well, you're the reason why I'm rich because I will only depend on my source. I will only depend on God. Yes, that's a lot of money, that's a lot of possession. And actually, Abram was entitled to it because he won, right? He won the spoils of war, the pl- he won the plunder. And, but at the same time, Abram still did not say, well, it's actually mine. Well, you know, I deserved this, right? It's well deserved. He didn't think any of that. Because he knew that what God could give is so much more than what any king on earth can give. And that should be our attitude as well. With our giving, our finances, our time, our efforts. We're saying we're not going to give in to the resources because we know and we have the ultimate source, and that is God and God alone. He truly believed that he, God, the Most High, can outman, outmatch any man's offer. And so in your life, Right now, there are some things that are presented to you that might look good. Can you honestly say, you know what, whatever happens, God is my source. I can give freely to God because he belongs everything. Everything belongs to him. Can we say that? Abraham knew and understood that he will not lack anything. And this is the same commitment that Paul has as we close. It says, not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. 
I know how to live in almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. And this is where he says, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Because God is my source, whether I have nothing or I have everything, that wouldn't really matter because all my eyes can think about and, and my eyes can fix upon would be Jesus. That's it. He is the source of my strength. And this morning, I ask you the same. What is your source? Is it God the most high? Or is it someone else or something else? Do we truly trust God with everything in our lives? Or do we just simply know that yes, he's God most high, but it's not God most high in my life? Where is our heart at this morning? Well, we can actually have this commitment with God as well. It does not stop with Abram, does not stop with Paul. God offers us the same for him to be our source. And so this is actually the final one. We're actually going to conclude here. I know we always say, that we're concluding, even though it takes us about 30 minutes to do so. But this morning, as we conclude, let this be our prayer. That whatever giants and mountains that you're facing, whatever power and authority that you're facing, whoever and whatever that is, God is so much higher than that. Nothing can compare to God. I hope and pray that we realize that today. And so if you want to make that same commitment with God, if you want Him as your God most high, I invite you to stand up and we'll pray for God to present Himself to us as the God Most High. Hallelujah, Father. We thank you, God, that you revealed yourself as the God Most High in Abram's life. And Lord, you remain the same today and forever how you presented yourself as the sovereign God. You are presenting yourself to us right now. And you are saying, Lord, that you can be the God most high in our life. Lord, that we can trust on you, that we can depend on you, Lord, with anything and everything. God, that we don't have to cower in fear, Lord, but we will be like Abraham. We will be like Abraham, ready, courageous, full of confidence. Not because he looks at his resources, not because he looks at his skills and achievements. Lord, because he fixes his eyes on you. Father, we want to do the same. Life can get tiring. Chasing fame and power can get exhausting. Restlessness becomes our daily routine. Worry, our daily attitude. But God, today, that stops. Father, we are committing our life to you. Everything and every aspect of our life. Father, we want you to be the highest. 
Father, that you are the only one on the throne, Lord. Nothing else on the pedestal but you, God. Father, we are committing everything, even our finances, Lord, our strength, our capabilities, our families, relationships, every single thing, God. We're giving this to you because you know better than ours. You know better than us, Lord. You are in control, God. You are the ruler and overrules anything that the enemy tries to do in our life, Father. So we are declaring, God, your victory in our life. Father, I know, God, that you work everything for our good and according to your purpose. Father, I pray that out of this, you will be glorified, God that your heaven will be advanced in our lives, Father. I pray this in the name of Jesus, and everyone says amen and amen.